the case. You get the case. The judge always likes to see that you're ready. And I'm going to summate basically the case briefly. Basically, it is a religious test case wherein Jehovah's Witnesses in the, in the year of 1943 wanted their right to be able to go and preach among the public because that is their right to evangelize, okay? Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, they wanted them to have a license to solicit, okay? This is basically the crux of the case. Now, what happened was uh, this, the Jehovah's Witness claimed their First Amendment right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the right to worship and, and uh, exercise their religion, unencumbered, right? And, of course, that's one of the mainstays that, that founded this country, was the religious freedom, okay? And basically, the points on the case that are established are, a state may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution, and that a flat license tax here involved restrains in advance the constitutional liberties of press and religion and inevitably tends to suppress their existence. All right, let's pull that over there. Everybody see that? Okay. All right, I'll start again. A state may not impose a charge for the re enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution and that a flat license tax here involved restrains in advance the constitutional liberties of the press and religion and inevitably tends to suppress the exercise thereof, that the ordinance is non-discriminatory and that it applies also to peddlers of wares and merchandise is immaterial. The liberties granted by the First Amendment are and in a preferred position. Since the privilege in question is guaranteed by the federal constitution and exists independently of the state's authority, the inquiry as to whether the state has given something for which it cannot ask a return is irrelevant. All right? No state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. Now, a lot of people come back to me and say, well, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, so that case doesn't apply to me. I want you to reach. I want you to understand we're not talking about whether you're a Jehovah's Witness here. What we're talking about here is are you an American and do you have rights? What they are talking about here is that these Jehovah's Witness people exercised their rights timely. That they had a right to worship and exercise and, and, and worship their God and evangelize as they chose and that the state came in and arbitrarily converted that right into a privilege and issued a license and a fee for it. That is totally unconstitutional. Now we took that case as a pioneering case and we argued that case for all of your constitutional rights. All you need to do is keep in mind that you are an American and you have constitutional rights, number one. Number two, you have to keep in mind what right. Can you pull the right out of the Constitution? If you can pull the right out of the Constitution, and I'll give you an example. How about the right to travel freely and encumbered, pursuant to Shapiro versus Thompson, and we'll get into that. How about the right to keep and bear arms, right? Does a state have a right to require a license and a fee for the exercise of the right? And if they do, can you ignore the license and the fee? We'll get into that. Now, obviously... In this case, it's clearly established, and this is the premise of this case, no state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege, issue a license and a fee for it, and require you to have that. Otherwise, you committed a crime. That's totally, 100% unconstitutional. I want that to get across real clear. Now let's jump to the next case. By the way, Murdoch is recorded at 319. That's the 319 volume. U.S. Reports, page 105. We'll start the case. All right? Go read the case, though. Make sure you read the case. I don't want anybody to come up and tell me they didn't read the case because I'm going I'm to get on you. You're not following. That's failure to follow instructions. Okay? Now, we're going to walk down the next step of this case. We, we took care of Murdoch here. Let's go to Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, which is recorded at volume 373. You same U.S. reports, you go to volume 373, turn to page 262. When we go to Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, this is another unique religious case, okay? In this case, six ministers were accused, excuse me, of inciting to riot and otherwise create a disturbance and disturb the peace, okay? They had a sit-down. This case came down in 1962. And what happened was they said they needed to have a license to, to have a public uh, gathering, okay? 
And what happened was it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, no, 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 you don't need to have a license for the exercise of a First Amendment right to freely assemble. Okay? Right, basically, the, the gist of the case is uh, the Negro ministers were convicted in Alabama State Court of aiding and abetting in violation of criminal trespass ordinance in Birmingham, Alabama. The only evidence against them was to the effect that they had incited 10 Negro students to engage in a sit-down demonstration at a white lunch counter. Actually, there were six ministers, but only two got charged. As a protest against the racial segregation. And they cite other cases. A lot of times you can find other cases in these cases. In Gober v. City of Birmingham, Alabama, this court today holds on the authority of Peterson v. City of Greenville that the convictions of those ten students for criminal trespass were constitutionally invalid. Since those convictions have been set aside, it follows that these petitioners did not incite or aid and abet any crime and that therefore the convictions of these petitioners must be set aside. Now basically what they were claiming is their constitutional right to freely assemble. The cities was claiming that they had to have a license to put on a demonstration, which they didn't have, and they were charging them with a criminal trespass for not having a valid license to freely assemble and or uh, protest, okay? Now, the gist of this case, I want you to see the significance of this case in view of the second, uh, the, the case we gave you before that. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania clearly established that no state could convert a secured liberty and a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. Because everybody got that. Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama said that if the state does convert your right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it, you can ignore the license and a fee and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. they got to let you go. All right? Does everybody see that? It's very important that you understand, first, your constitution is the supreme law of the land and that you have that right. And that that right shall not be infringed. And it's supposed to be enforced in favor of you, the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary. It's very important that you understand that no state may convert that right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. And if they do, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama says you can ignore the license and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. Now, the next case is very important. And it's very important that you see the argument. Okay? That's United States versus Bishop. That's 412, volume 412, United States Reports. This is page 346. Let me come down here. United States versus Bishop is a very unique case. Basically what Bishop does is it sets a standard for what constitutes a criminal violation in terms of willful intent. Okay? Willfulness is, is one of the major elements that is required to be proven in any criminal element, you have to prove, one, that you're the party, two, that you had a method or an opportunity to do the thing, and third, that you did so with a willful intent. Now, when we get to willful intent, willful is defined as an evil motive or intent to avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty. Obviously, in the previous two cases, you have decided that you have relied on the United States Constitution, and you have relied on decisions of the United States Supreme Court. So, could you have willfully done any deed or crime? Obviously not. So, guess what? This case stipulates that you have a perfect defense to the element of willfulness. All right? Since the burden on the prosecution is to prove that you did willfully and knowingly avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty, he cannot perform that task, can he? Because it's obviously you have a constitutional immunity to that. The previous case, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, says they couldn't even punish you. The case before that said you didn't need a license for the exercise of a right. And the case before that said your constitutional right is supreme over any state law. So if they pass the law in violation of your constitution, the constitution overwhelms the state law. So the law doesn't even exist in law. Does everybody see that? Now since the prosecutor does not have a cause of action for which relief can be granted, Your Honor, may it please the court, counsel is specifically precluded from performing his major task. Therefore, Your Honor, may it please the court at this time, I would motion most graciously for a dismissal with prejudice for failure to state a cause of action for which relief may be granted by this honorable court, and I'd kind of like to collect my costs and fees for having to defend this patently frivolous and spurious complaint, sir. May it please the court. Laughter will usually break out thereafter, at which point the judge will usually turn to the prosecutor and say, well, Mr. Prose, what do you think we ought to do about this young fella? And he'll say, I'd go for the motion to dismiss, Your Honor. And the judge will turn to him and say, that's a good answer, because I don't think you're ready for this kid today. And 40 attorneys will break out laughing. Okay, that's actually happened to me, folks. I'm telling you, this argument is a killer argument. It's good for every single constitutional right you've got. All you have to do is fill in the blanks. What constitutional right? 
prove that you